Mr. Chambers, and I know we wish we could clone him and bring him up to Northern California. We have tried over the years, but it, it has not worked. Um, and we're going to move into, into my world, into the adult world, to hear about some of the health issues for adults with cerebral palsy. Dr. Chambers. Thank you. So, is this on? So um, one of my other areas of, of interest, actually the other thing I do, half, half of my practice is sports medicine, so it's kind of a strange thing, but um, I, I take care of adults with cerebral palsy and all disabilities, um, and I've been uh, doing that since the uh, early 90s. The, um, one of the things I'm most proud about in the Cerebral Palsy Academy is I got, them to, I got us to change our uh, mission statement to include the lifespan because there was no scientific organization that um, even studied problems with uh, adults with cerebral with with cerebral palsy or other developmental disabilities. So I'm going to just talk about transitions in healthcare and just using cerebral palsy as a model because there are any other disorder could could work in this. And you already have my disclosure, so I won't go through that. Um, so we all know the problem, and it's particularly in this room, I don't have to go through it, but you know, up, up until the age of 16, in some places it stopped, care, pediatric care starts at six, stops at 16, and in, in California it stops at 21. Um, we, the, our kids get the best care they could possibly get. We have the best pediat pediatricians, developmental pediatricians, neurologists. Our CCS clinic, our CCS system in, San, in uh, California is fantastic, and then and we have great Shriner systems. We have great children's regional hospitals. I mean, things are, are, are fantastic. And then you turn 21 and you just drop off the cliff. And we all know that that's, that's the problem. <laughs> I have an amen from this corner. Um, so um, once again, I, I told you I'd have a little hint of this, that I thought that we we're taught that cerebral palsy is a non-progressive brain disorder. And I have seen enough changes in my adult population that I'm not quite sure that that's true. Um, I, I've seen uh, people be develop Parkinson's-like sim symptoms when they're in their 20s. Um, I've seen MRI changes in the brain, but that people have, neurologists have told me, well, that's just because they have uh, changes in the um, circulation of, of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and that's why it looks bad. But I, th there are actually some changes, so I'm not quite sure that that's true, because remember all the people that made these definitions are pediatricians, and they don't follow them into adulthood and don't know what's going on. So, I mean, the last, the last time I found a really good thing on the round table of aging and cerebral palsy was a long time ago. Um, and, but they brought up the same problems that we're, we haven't solved any of these. And we're in, so I think there's nothing new in, in this um, about exercise. We talked about some women's issues yesterday, um, how, how we provide the quality of care. Nutrition's a huge problem. Um, many of my adult patients have, are either undernourished or uh, overnourished. Um, we have medical, medical conditions that, are, that we all have, heart disease, hypertension, that just get worse with age that we just ascribe to the children, people having cerebral palsy. Um, communication um, becomes harder as you get older if your parents aren't there to help uh, interpret for you or the, if you're living in a, a group home or some other living situation where people can't understand what you're talking about. Um, the psychosocial aspects of aging that we all have and then, um, and then economics. We'll talk about some of these. So um, there are many more people with chronic conditions that are living past the age of 18. We all know that. There's no, no surprise. As I told you earlier, there are more adults with cerebral palsy than there are children. I try to make this argument to the dean of my medical school all the time. He goes, well, um, um, but it is, it's the answer that the Department of Medicine told me, but aren't they all on Medicaid? And I go, well, yeah. Well, we don't want to see them. So... And that's exactly what happens. And so we have all of these patients that are now uh, living, you know, things like people with muscular dystrophy didn't used to live. We have much better care, and, um, and now we have adults with muscular dystrophy we don't know what to do with. Um, and, you know, if we look at the life expectancy of able-bodied uh, North, able -bodied North Americans, um, you know, it, in 1900 it was 47 years old. Um, at, uh, in 95 it's 76 years old. And... Um, there's, you know, so if you're 65, if you were age 65 in 1995, you, you have 17 more years to live. It's a lot, it's a lot more than that now. 
Um, I can't believe I didn't change that slide. Um, but life expectancy and Down syndrome, um, if you were born in 1929, your average life was nine years because of the heart disease mainly. Um, that, was, that was how long people lived. And uh, if you're born in 1989, it's 56 years. So I still, I still get calls from cardiologists who are, you know, are where adult cardiologists, friends of mine, who have, uh, have a person with Down syndrome show up in their office and they go, I have never seen a person with Down syndrome. I don't even know what's going on. But you guys saved them. I mean, the, our cardiothoracic surgeon saved them. You guys saved them, and what am I supposed to do? And I go, well, it sounds like you have a problem. Um, <laughs> But, but, that is, but it is a problem because we don't know, there's a lot of things that we just don't know the natural history of. And as we do more and more uh, keeping children alive, we don't know what to, what to do. I, I just took care of a child who was cured, tru truly cured of Tay-Sachs disease. They have no, the enzymes are completely back, stem cells, completely neurologically devastated. And I have no idea what to do for this kid. I mean, there's no natural history. Uh, his, his hips were dislocated, and he was becoming painful, and I put them back in. But I don't know what they're gonna, how they're going to do this. And then every one of these genetic problems that we have no idea what the natural history is is, is going to be a, a challenge for us. Um, and so one of, the, one of the big, if you're just looking at cerebral palsy in general, the big, the big um, determinant of how long, uh, how long they're going to live often depends on whether they have a seizure disorder or not. So it may be because they aspirate or because that means there's a more, more severe CP. But if you don't have a, 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 um, a seizure disorder, it seems like your life expectancy is probably 10 to 15 years longer. But no one's exactly sure what that is. So the mean now is about 60 years old. So we have a long time, 40 years, of kids who have no real, well, kids. I guess they're kids now. They're younger than I am, but that that are we have people that are um, living till they're 60 and that have no care during that time or very poor care, and that's where the problem with the access to medical care. So, and I think some of the problem is the 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 train the way we train our physicians. We train um, the prime the the people who take care of the primary care problems as pediatricians or internists. And then there's family practitioners who are supposed to span that gap, and there are now med peds people that, that do that. But almost all the med peds people that I talk to don't get into this to take care of people with disabilities. There's other, they have other interests um, um, than, than that, including our university at UCSD. And so, um, the, and, and this really, I was kind of joking around with our dean about what our dean said, but it's totally true. Um, the reimbursement for this is so poor, and I can't, I really can't blame a, a, a internal medicine doctor who has no training in, cere in cerebral palsy or developmental disabilities and having an, a, a, someone in a wheelchair with 20 medical problems and problems with cerebral palsy come into their office for the $19 that they get for that. And it's really, I can't blame anybody, but it's, it's, not, it's, it's a shame on our society, not a shame on them. Um, and, you know, you get a $6 for return visit with Medi-Cal. I don't know if you know that how, how well you get reimbursed as a doctor. Um, and then the problem with the durable, durable medical equipment, how do, how do we get it? And I think you, someone mentioned it in the CCS talk is, I mean, you know, when, when they're in CCS, they're taken care of. You, they, you, get, you get the equipment, it's all, but once, you, once you're out of that, you're in Medicaid and it's tough to get, get the equipment. Transportation becomes a bigger problem as, um, <laughs> I, get <a> lot of <laughs> I guess that's a no kidding, huh? And, uh, and, and it really is true. You, you probably don't appreciate that, but you people that have jobs in California, at least in San Diego, I can't, maybe I can't speak for California, you have to call the, the um, uh, bus every, every day. You have to say, you need to pick me up tomorrow, sometimes between 8 and 12 or something, whenever they, whenever they say they're going to show up. Or you may not get a ride at all. Yeah, so that's exactly right. And so transportation is, is a real problem. And then access to doctor's offices. Are, is really bad. My son sees a psychiatrist who is totally embarrassed that he doesn't have access to his place. So he comes to the house for a house call. There's not many psychiatrists do house calls, but then I pay him cash, so he probably doesn't, I, there's a, <laughs> it's probably a different reason. Um, and that comes to access to mental health care. So as I told you a little bit earlier in my adult clinic, I have a very high instance of, of mental health issues that are totally unaddressed. Um, I, have, that's, I have a hard time getting people to see them, to see um, uh, people with, these, with, with problems. And then there's communication issues and some of the things we talked about yesterday um, 
um, with the sexuality issues and gender issues are also um, uh, have have problems. Um, there's the social stigma of mental illness on top of having mental illness. There's there's that problem, um, and then problems with compliance with medication, um, which is true of all people that have bipolar disorder, for example, or depression. The, you know the, the medication side effects are really terrible. So my son has bipolar disorder, and some of the side effects of the medications are dystonia and tardive dyskinesia, right? So you've already got that. Let's make that worse. Um, so that's not so good. And then the quality, um, once again, we, you know, we just don't have physicians that know what they're doing. We talked about dental care access yesterday, and um, I, uh, I've had two patients die of dental abscesses. So I've taken care of them their entire life, they get an abscess, they aspirate, and they get a multi-bacteria, multi-microbial um, bacterial infection that can't be taken care of with antibiotics, just because no one brushes their teeth. Um, in California, in San Diego, I, I actually talked to our regional center. It's okay in group homes if they don't brush their teeth; they just stick the stuff in their mouth, like Listerine or something, and that's all they have to do. Well, we all know that that doesn't do anything, and um, but that's what they have to do now. Um, and once again, most of our medical care is accessed through the emergency room. So the general health issues are, you know, let's say here's the dental, the dental stuff, um, and, and this is what, where, it, where it came down to. So they don't get the dental hygiene when the, their parents are around, they do. But once they get into a different living um, situation, they may not get, even on a weekly basis, their teeth cleaned. Um, exercise, something that we all need to do. It's uh, important for aging. And um, how many adults with disabilities do we have do aerobic exercise? None, right? I mean, it's really hard to do. And it's, and even the, even the people who GMFCS, you know, if you're a GMFCS three, you get plenty of aerobic exercise because <laughs> you're using, you're using your walker and stuff. But the people that are, uh, you know, as you get older and you have a sedentary job, like many of us do, you sit around, you're not, the last thing at, after you're totally exhausted from walking around on crutches is to come home and, and do some exercises. And what, we don't really have any guidelines. We talked a lot about this yesterday, and I think this is, um, there's no re reason to bring this up. I, I do know that in my adult clinic, I'm the one that sets up all of these appointments. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I mean, you got it. This is, this is really bad. So I set up the pap smears, and I set up the, the breast, you know, the mammograms. And, um, and have discussions with menopause with my older patients. So um, I am the wrong person. No, 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 I'm the wrong person to be doing that. <laughs> There's no clapping there. There's something wrong with that. that uh, you, don't, you don't want that. Um, and we talked about nutrition, overweight and underweight. Um, and and, and um, one of the most common causes of death in, in adults with cerebral palsy is aspiration and choking. Um, and, and you lose, people do lose function. They have the pseudobulbar palsy. Um, any medication that they take, if you have reflux from being overweight or just as you get, you know, those of us who get older, you get reflux, it can actually be a, a life threatening problem in adults. And, and especially if you're fed in a nursing home where people are just chewing, putting stuff in your mouth, it doesn't really matter what you're, if you're swallowing it or not. And once again, the, um, if you have no teeth, your teeth are all rotten, your nutrition gets, your nutrition gets worse. And so um, as you get older, as all of us get older, our, our, our lungs be are become less strong. And so you have, that alters your speech patterns. As, and so it's dif more difficult to understand. Um, and then everything that um, adults have that as you get older, people with cerebral palsy who are people get as well. And so, and these are, and these are all these problems. Um, but things, but things are just, people just miss these. And, and osteopenia, so we've had a little bit of, somebody mentioned some things about fragility fractures. Um, you know, they, they are a little bit higher, but not as much as I thought they would be. I don't take care, I, I would say, I see as many fragility fractures in children as I see in adults. So I'm not, I don't think it's that, that huge of a problem. Um, mainly because a lot of times if you're spastic, even though you're not standing, your, muscles, your bones aren't particularly that bad, um, it, which is a little bit of surprise. A little bit of surprise. Um, substance abuse is a problem with, with our patients, with our adult patients. Um, I have to say it's a little bit worse since January 1st. I have a lot of, I have a lot of people showing up stoned to my clinic. Um, but that's just my nurses. Uh, 
so, no, but this is, this is becoming a little bit more of a problem. But some of the, some of the, uh, so once again, don't, don't, don't uh, miss those. Um, th things that do, do get worse over time, and, I, and I've seen this, are seizure disorders get worse as you get older. Um, we have early onset dementia, and I, I think that's either it's a talk or I'm, I'm, it's a talk coming up. Yeah. So there's um, early onset dementia, and early onset uh, Alzheimer's, um, in, in people with cerebral palsy. Parkin I've seen. I'm telling you, I've seen some patients with early Parkinson's disorder, which actually have been treated well with deep brain stimulation, um, which also helped their dystonia a little bit. But dystonia gets worse throughout life. Once again, these these problems are are get are are get are worse in adults with cerebral palsy, and the the vision problems are once again I told you remember the vision problems because of field cuts. Those field cuts can progress through life, and people lose their vision. And then it's often different. Who knows if you haven't monitored it throughout their life, you don't really know if that's just part of aging or you know just the, the normal loss of eyesight. Um, and then I see you see more reflux and more dental problems as kids, people get older. Um, like all of us, we have declining mobility, and it's magnified in people with, with cerebral palsy. That GMFCS, those curves that I showed you, you know, about the, I don't know if you noticed, they had two, they had three ages. One was 6 to 12, 12 to 18, and then the 19 through 23, and they've, that's as far as we've, they've gone out, you act people lose function. So you go from a 3 to a 4, a 4, rarely 4 to 5, but you go from a, a 2 to a 3, meaning you're, using a, you're just using um, AFOs, the next thing you do, you're using a walker, and then that group can drop down as they get older into wheelchairs. I think we all know that. You've seen it happen. Probably even your older teenagers where, where that happens because it's more convenient. It takes so much energy and life to get through, um, but then there's having a wheelchair is not the, the easiest thing in the world. But we all have decreased endurance as we get older, and that's a problem. Um, the other thing that, that, we, that, I, that I see in people that didn't even really have problems before is that you start having early arthritis. And because your joints don't go through a full range of motion, whether it's your hip or your knee or your ankle, um, these things break down fast. So if, you're, if you take your knee and just go through a range of motion like this, just going, that's all you're, that's all you're doing, though at that area of your knee wears down, and it's particularly the patellofemoral joint. And so we have some real, real problems, um, you know, in 30 and 40 year olds having arthritis that I see in 60 year olds, you know, we see in 60 year olds uh, typically developing people. And the spine gets worse too. A lot of back pain. Um, I, I would say most of my adult clinic is pain. And that's what we're seeing and, and, and trying to figure out why, why that is. And is there any role for orthopedic surgery? Um, we don't really know. So the other, the other problem is um, if you have um, athetoid CP, which is actually less than it, you know, that, that was very common back in the, in the 50s and 60s um, before we realized about hyperbilirubinemia. A lot of adults had this choreoathetosis movement with, typical, with normal mentation. Um, and you'd see people walking down the road, you know, and, and having a hard time talk, but if, when you talk to them, they, there was no other problem. And when they sat down and weren't moving around, they didn't have problems. But this, um, the constant movement of your neck, either with athetosis or with um, dystonia, for example, can cause uh, spurs that I've, I've, we, I have a patient that uh, one of the bone spurs cut the spinal cord in half. And people watched this guy get worse and worse and worse and said, oh, he's got CP. And so his spinal cord was cut in half at C7. Um, and, um, and so these are, uh, and so you, you get these and, um, and you also can get ruptured disc that people miss. And that's what, this is from the, from the, from the motion. And also as we all get older, our muscles waste. It's sarco sarcopenia. Sorry, you're all wasting away right here. Um, and that's why we have to lift weights and that's an important part of, it's not just for orthopedic surgeons. Okay. Just remember that you have to lift weights. Um, and the other thing that we see is many more skin breakdowns, um, more uh, skin ulcers. As, uh, once again, as you get older, when you're young, you can do a lot of things. If you sit in the same position um, and you can't move your body around, you, you get skin breakdown pretty easily. And you think of, you know, you can think of your 90-year-old grandparents who, you know, when they hit the wall or something, their skin just flakes off. And, it's, and that's, it happens sooner in people with cerebral palsy because they're always sitting in the same position. And so we, we see a lot of that. And so here's, a, here's someone that came to me and had a lot of, I guess that light, I'm going to turn that light down, um, 
I don't know if you can see it, but he was having swallowing problems. First of all, he had a spinal cord stimulator, which was supposed to help his spasticity. Obviously, nobody does that anymore, but that was an idea. Um, but he couldn't swallow, and he had a swallowing test, and they said everything was negative. And I don't know if you can see right here, but his, his vertebral bodies are twice as wide as the other ones. It's right there, and, and I actually looked at the swallowing study, and it goes right there, and it goes bloop comes right back out. Um, so that was a very simple solution, well, surgery, but it was a simple solution and that we just had to take those spurs off and he was able to swallow right away. And he actually gained 10 pounds and so it was a really, but, it, but you just have to look for it and that's, and that's the question. So as I said, uh, chronic pain is the biggest problem that I have. And so there's um, the botulinum toxins, uh, oral medication, and, and um, I forgot to add it on there, but I, I really do think there's a role in the canna, uh, in the cannab cannaboid, cannaboids, this is marijuana, um, <laughs> but uh, but the, but you know with this CBD thing, I think there's going to be you know it doesn't have to be the THC part um, where you get high, but the um, and, and maybe impair your fun. <laughs> Sounds good, huh? <laughs> uh, um, but also, but so I think there's going to be I think. I hope that we'll be able to study this someday. Um, all things must end. Um, pain medications are a real problem, uh, with, especially with the opioid over, um, overuse. Um, probably the biggest problem, uh, I've rarely seen adults that are, uh, that are opioid um, dependent. Um, it, it, certainly, it certainly could be possible, but one of the biggest problems that they realize right away is constipation. They already have constipation and that's the last thing they wanna add to their, their life. Um, all these other things of uh, massage, chiropractic, healing touch. My wife's a healing touch practitioner. I think those are all really important. My wife comes to all of my CP clinics, particularly my adult clinics. They love seeing her and they hate seeing me. Um, <laughs> and um, doing, doing wheelchair modifications for pain is really important for the therapist to, to, take, to, to, to look at. Um, you, you change. I mean, we, you, we all know they change through adolescence just because they're growing. But as you get older, your weight changes either up or down. If you have a little scoliosis, if it curves just a little bit more, and you don't need surgery, but you have to change your chair. And once again, those skin issues. Um, and I would say um, I was doing so much of this that I hired a physiatrist just to do my adult it helped do my adult care, um, and really, is, that's fantastic. Um, so she spends a lot of time. Frequent changing of positions. The psychosocial issues, we talked about that. 75% of adults, even the, C, the, the GMFCS3 and above, are, are, are independent in ADLs, but then it, they, um, that means the more aren't. 30% um, still live at home with their parents. Um, I saw a 67-year-old whose 87-year-old mother brought him in. That's not good for any of those, those two people. Um, once again, high incidence depression, low self-esteem, and I talked about these depressant things. So transition from home to community, um, we have to, you know, as, as doctors and uh, providers, how, you know, what, what's available for people? You know, do they stay at home? Do they move into residential facilities? What are the community-based programs that are available? And unfortunately, in our, in our place, we, we've, actually looked at all of them they're on our website but they're not they're not easy to find all these programs are not out there out, even us looking for them and knowing where to look for they're hard they're hard to find um do they go into an intermediate care facility which we hope would be a ter the worst place that they could go um uh, community homes there are some great community homes and there are some really bad community homes um you know after watching that aclu thing yesterday i was just thinking of how some of those things could are just rife for for that um, supported living, I think these are, this is a really good option. Um, uh, independent living, my son's actually in, in supported living, so he has, we bought a house for him, and then he has people coming in to, um, to care for him 24 hours a day. And he, you know, we see him four times a week, but we don't have to do the, the care, which you don't want your parents to be doing that. Um, there are some people who can live independently, sometimes having people come by and just checking on to them and seeing how they're doing. Um, the transition from school to work, you know, is we, the public schools, once again, they're just like us. Once you're done, you're done. Sorry. Um, we do have programs that go up to 21. Um, in, in San Diego, it's called the TRACE program. I don't, do you have that here? And uh, Same thing? Okay. And so I think those are, those are really good for transition. Um, college, we had the, 
the um, woman, young woman who went, got her master's, and those are all, those are options, obviously much more complex, and, and we help support many patients in San Diego who go to college. Um, we talk to their counselors, and we um, provide all their, they're not IEPs, or, but they're, it's, they're similar to that for the, for the colleges. Um, vocational training is, it, it seems like there, we used to do a lot of this, it seems like there's less of this um, now, but I think that's, that's, that's the thing we can go. We talked about the unemployment rate. Um, most people re receive government stipends, that's at risk right now, as you've seen some of the bills before Congress. Um, we gotta pay for those tax cuts, and that's where it's gonna come from. I was just in Louisiana last week, um, I guess I can be political in San Francisco. <laughs> I was just in Louisiana last week, and they, you know, they, they, like Kansas, cut all their taxes. And the very first thing they cut was all the services for disabled um, uh, uh, children and adults. That was, it was on the front page of the, the paper there just the day before yesterday. So, and, uh, so that's, that's, where we're, that's where we're headed. So um, getting jobs are, are really important, and, and we're involved in, in that and helping people get jobs. Um, we work through the regional center as much as we can, but there's you know, just regular competitive employment like we all have. Um, supported employment, where there may be a, um, someone coming to help someone go to, go to work, giving a, like a job coach. Um, and these are, there's very few of these left, these day programs and sheltered workshops. In some way, that's positive. In some ways, it's negative. There, in some of the positive ways, it gets it, it forces um, the individual with a disability to be in the community. It forces our, well, it encourages our people in, that have uh, that are employers to have people with disabilities. But that doesn't always work. Um, but the sheltered workshops were just another way to isolate and um, segregate our people with disabilities. And so I, I, I don't really have a, a thought about that, but I know we're seeing fewer of them. And so the transition from uh, adult pediatric to adult health care, a lot of it has to do with insurance. So the whole, the Medicare Act was set up, uh, Medicare, Medi-Cal, CMS type thing was set up to have this dichotomy at age 18 or 21. And, um, and so that was set up in the 60s, and that's the problem. So why don't we have CCS for life? And why, why, where, where did that come from? We give them just the best care at all. It's the same money, same trunk of money comes from the, you know, the state. One goes to Medicaid instead of going to CCS. And why not keep that great program going? And, and I've talked to our legislator. You know, the one thing about term limits is your legislators don't know anything about anything. Right? I mean, they, you know, it's, just, it's terrible. But I'm not, I don't know if that's right or not, but they don't know anything. They don't even know what CCS is. So um, the, once again, the mental health issues are a real problem as far as how do we get anybody to take care of those patients. Um, we want our, want our adults to have real choices in all aspects of life, have, um, provide functional skills, not just what you've learned in high school. Um, you're, this, this, these are, these are from fam this is, these are actually from adults with cerebral palsy, what, what they want. You want to have an interaction with a variety of people. You want to be in just in generic services. You don't have your own special little place to go. You want to, don't go to, uh, you want to go to the YMCA or the JCC across the street. You know, have access to community resources, um, a range of community environments, not just the one place where you get to go. You want to live in a typical neighborhood, not in a little isolated place. Um, some, do, what we all do, you have to have something to do every day. And if you don't, you don't survive. It's one of the reasons that people retire and they don't, if they don't have anything, they don't last very long. Um, you want to have non-adversarial interactions, instead of having to fight for everything that you have in, in your life. Um, re have friends, and, um, and that brings up these issues. And we talked about sexuality and self-esteem yesterday. I took a lot of these slides out. Um, um, we talked about the competency yesterday about um, how that's a civil right that can be taken away and why they, they don't take it seriously. Now, I, I might have disagreed a little bit with the, um, I'm forgetting her name, she was, it was so great. Like, well, anyways, the the pu oh, not the public defender, I wasn't there for that one, the, the person from the ACLU, Susan. Um, anyway, she said that it's hard to get your um, rights back. Well, every, every three years, my son, we have to take my, my son has a lawyer and we have to take a lawyer and we go to court. It's not a messing around stuff. So it, it's obviously very expensive because I have to pay for both lawyers, but, um, <laughs> but we, still have to, we still have to go to court and, and 
have the discussion. Has anything changed? And so uh, I think our judges in San Diego take it very seriously because they realize that you're taking away people's civil rights. Um, so um, our population with disabilities is growing rapidly. We um, know little about the natural history of these disabilities. And I'm, as, I'm kind of guilty. Uh, the only people that come to my clinic are people that have a problem. So my denom I don't know what my denominator is. I know what my numerator is. It's 5,100 patients. But I don't know what my denominator is. And so they may, those other people may be doing great, or they just can't get in to see us. And so I don't know how, what, what the natural history is. Um, so, so we need to do research. And there's no, I, I can guarantee you there's no money I've tried in this area. Um, we need to educate our medical students and other health care providers in adult, adult care. Amen. Another amen. Um, and, uh, and that needs to be, that can start now. There's no reason why that can't be done in, in right now. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and then our, we have to have, um, you know, a health maintenance organization other than just a way for money to be put. This is, this is a perfect um, position for HMO whether it's a state-run HMO or whatever. And, and I know we have that opportunity, but I guarantee the people, um, there was a, a thing that people with Medi-Cal, Medicaid had to be in an HMO. Um, and I lost about a half of my patients whose parents call me every day going, there's no one in this HMO that knows how to take care of someone with disability. And I, you probably have run into that too. So I see them for free, um, but there's not many other people that can, can do that. And so what are the solutions? And uh, Clarissa, I don't know if, if she's here today, because I, I don't usually give this talk to you all because I stole it, her stuff. You're supposed to hide where you steal stuff from. But I stole it from her, um, from this conference when I came a couple years ago. And um, her, her thing, this ITOP, uh, Improving Transitional Outcomes, um, is you know, provider competency, access to quality health care, patient support, quality assurance and oversight, public engagement and support, and you can see it's very similar to what she did in the ADAPT, is it, was it ADAPT? Uh, Aspire, Aspire, yesterday, um, to, you know, for, for children and uh, parents and families with autism. Um, so how do we, we need to train and mentor these, these people. It's hard to find mentors because there's not many around that know anything about it. Um, and the use of electronic health records so they can be transferred from place to place, I think is really important. I, it's the bane of my existence, electronic health records. I hate it, but it's great and when, when they're done well. It's just an extra two hours at the every, end of every one of my days. Um, and then the, the barriers, whether it's exam rooms or how families, how people get access to information and longer appointment times, someone, that was brought up this morning. And then, um, and provide and have uh, specialized doctors, specialists who will be able to see these, see these people. Um, so how do we get this access, this information out? Well, the computer is great, but many people can't, many people with CP can't, either don't have access to a computer, they don't have high speed internet, you know, going to the library is certainly not the easiest thing in the world to get to, to get this information. And so I think that's gonna, that's a real, uh, that's a barrier for, for people. Um, we talked a little bit about the language barrier, um, not having all these information in Spanish. Half my patients are Spanish speakers, so it's really hard uh, to do that. Um, how do we get the? Uh, how do you reimburse the the doctors and the health facilities so they'll they'll be um, want to want to take care of this? How do we change our transportation? Um, you know the clinicians. Those there's I'm lucky. I have residents and fellows and nurse practitioners and PAs and all those. I have I have tons of help. Um, but most people are by themselves, or many, many primary care doctors are by themselves. And you can't expect them to see someone, you know, if you see five patients with disabilities and you make $29 a, a visit, that's not a very good day. It doesn't even turn on the lights. Um, and then can we provide health care in natural settings? Can we have, have ways to have mobile vans to go around? And I think those are all possibilities. Um, education for, for our patients and their families and um, people are caring for them. Um, who, who, makes, who helps make decisions? These, this is going to be, this is a real, a real question and I think um, this is something Clarissa has, has a, a, a looked at. How do, we, how do we teach our caregivers? I mean, my son has 12 caregivers. They make the minimum wage. And, you know, I'm, I'm trusting, that's a lot of trust. Um, that's why we're over there four or five times a, a week. Um, but the, for most people don't have advocates like, like we are. And then when we die, who's, who's going to be there? 
I mean, I, I'm assuming, I'm hoping I'm going to outlive my son. I mean, my son's going to outlive me. Um, and then um, coming up with a health care plan for every person. And that, that's very, very similar to what the roadblock that uh, Clarissa talked about yesterday. I mean, roadmap, not roadblock. <laughs> we do have roadblocks, but a roadmap. Um, and then just the quality assurance to make sure we're doing good things for, for people. And then, you know, educating the public on um, that, that this is a real problem. And as, once again, I, we're all going to be disabled at some point. And so when people are going, well, what do I care about someone with a wheelchair? Well, you might be in one someday. Or what do I care? And um, it's also the thing that you've seen. So when I was, uh, you know, just starting out all the, in pediatric orthopedics, all the parents came in those umbrella strollers, right? And now they've got those SUV double wides with, with DVD players built on them and all that kind of stuff. So that's because we have curb cuts. So... Um, so we want to um, develop a shared vision of responsibility um, that we that we are uh, champions, and then this is where our uh, one of our responsibilities, and we're the only people that can do this, is to educate our lawmakers. And um, having done that sometime, it's 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 kind of interesting. Um, I, it's it's fun, and you learn a lot. But you realize if you don't have like a checkbook with you, no one wants to talk to you. And and I, and I did learn that. That was that was quite a um, it, it, it's it's, it's kind of cool to be in the halls of Congress because you see it on TV all the time, but realize that you're like nothing. Um, and then um, look at the different different models, and that and this is where the real problem is, is you know we educate primary care specialists, and it's not going to be pediatricians because pediatricians don't want to take care of 60 year olds. That's why they're pediatricians. Family practitioners possibly, um, but they, I haven't found that them to be a very interested group in this, in this area. Um, we're, I'm getting ready to hire a med peds person, but I'm having a hard time finding one that is interested in it because once again, you don't get paid very much to do this, this really complex work. And it's really, it's in its hard stuff. Um, universities should be able to take this on. They have residents and fellows and it's, a, it's, a, it would be a great way. But once my university at UCSD does not want to see more than 7% Medicaid. That's their goal. And I, I don't know what to say. And that's just, that's just the way it is. So that's why I see all these patients. We need to get some lifespan physicians. And I think that's possibly coming. And I think we're, as we start doing things in, um, in our CP Academy and in some of our schools that this might happen. You know, it's interesting in Europe, um, the way that, um, at least in orthopedics, when they take care of a child, say the, a hip problem. So an orthopedic surgeon will take care of the newborn hip with DDH and will also put the total joint in. They take care of it through the whole lifespan. And we don't even do that in the United States. We, we stop the same thing. Adult, we have adult and pediatric providers. And so um, as you transition through life, these are my last, I'm back to cartoons, so now I can understand what's going on. Um, so you know when you, when you're, you bring your child home from, from the hospital, You've got these things they're, they're worried about. You have all these agencies, you have CC, all these CCS. What does all this stuff mean? Medi-Cal, all these um, things. You have all these me people are talking about PDAs and necrotizing enterocolitis and all these words you've never heard of. Um, your family's thrown into an upheaval. You have other children. And then you have uh, financial you know, financial problems on top of that. You have to buy a van. You have to buy these things. And then as they get older, you have to worry about what they do for leisure, you have to do this IEP for, I mean, the, you, this is a technology. So buying, buying those iPads, no one's paying for those. Um, bit, getting the, the, your big van to get kit people somewhere. Um, education, I had to do an IEP every year for my son. Or, or I mean, I had, to, I had to threaten to sue the school district every year until he graduated from high school. I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, I, I, I just bring in the law and I drop it down. I go, I know how to read the law and the guy, oh, it's the same principle, same everything. And so think of parents that aren't sophisticated, how hard that is. Um, and then I'm not saying I'm sophisticated, but I know how to read the law. <laughs> and then, um, and then social interactions. How do you, your kids have to, how do you get them to have, be out with their friends? I mean, that's, you know, that it's really hard. Um, then, you know, it, when I talked about job, everybody wants to have a job, everybody wants to have some self-worth. Um, and then we start talking about self-care and self-advocacy, and I'm really proud my son has really gotten into that. He, he advocates for himself all the time. When we say you should do this, he said no, and that's good. Um, <laughs> where do you live? Where do you live? And we talked about that um, just now. 
Conserv conservatorship, we talked about that. That's come up several times, um, and this group certainly understands it more than more than most. Um, but then we get into adults, and we just talked about the problems with medical care for adults. I'm get, we're all getting older. Parents are getting older. It's hard to take care of your your kids, and especially as they, you know, my son weighs 120 pounds, and I, my wife's a lot stronger than I am, but she lifts them all the time. But it's really hard. Hard, and then I have a lot of patients now who are retired, so they have a job. They've had a job. They retired age 55. They worked as post in the postal service, for example. All their friends are gone. Their whole social thing is gone, and they're very depressed. It's a very tough time for these for these people. And so, last slide, and finally, um, this is why you're all here. This is why I'm here. This is why we do these things, and we're all these people here that are holding up this giant. Um, triangle of all the things that happen for people with disabilities and look at what's the smallest part on this thing is medical up there this is the most important thing all these other things are the most important things so thank you very much for inviting me and we're going to have a little um, thanks